Greetings. Welcome to our first presentation on the great subject of timber framing. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of timber frames, the tools needed to, to uh, cut and erect the frames, design considerations, and the construction, putting up the frames. Um, we do have a couple of videos here, which I will review at the end. These are the actual names of the videos in YouTube, so um, you could easily just copy out or, or just type in there, Timber Frame Cottage Raising in PA, and that'll get you there. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so the, um, the predecessor, I guess, to, um, to timber framing, very primitive structures like the one pictured here. A big difference is these are kind of temporary, and these had stakes punched directly into the ground, obviously prone to rotting. And cross members were lashed together with strips of animal hides or primitive rope. So the, right here, that connection would all be tied together. Then the step to where we actually became timber frames, I'd say, is um, getting these frames up off out of the ground and off of the ground, so uh, much more stable there. And that the timbers were being carved and cut to um, to accept to join each other. So built on foundations or stone footings, yes, and joinery was permanently fastened. But it was such uh, early mortise and tenon joint right there. Okay, um, so timber framing as a building method dates back to about 500 or 100 BC. Um, back at this time, most buildings, especially the ones that have survived, were made out of stone and masonry. However, many of their roof, roof systems were actually timber frames, big heavy beam systems. Um, so this is early on. It's at this time that the uh, basic mortise and mortise and tenon were developed. So you should definitely know this vocabulary. So that is a tenon, the positive piece. And this is the negative, where it, the um, tenon would be let into, is how I would say it. The tenon is let into the mortise. Um, so here is an open version where it's exposed on the end. There's a your basic one that's closed. And here's one where it's pinned. So it would be fit up and then drilled and then pinned. Okay, um, so here kind of the uh, the heyday of timber framing, which um, we uh, most many of us associate it with. Here, the ninth, tenth centuries in Europe, kind of um, what we think of when we think of timber historic timber framing. These gorgeous um, kind of gingerbread houses, and there's a beautiful one. So this this particular part of the frame here is called a crook. And, and that is a, a tree that would have been split right down the middle and then kind of folded out like a mirror image. So this has been from the same, same tree. A very, very sophisticated um, part of, the tim of timber framing to design and cut that, actually. All right. So this goes on to say that um, while things were happening in Europe, things were also happening in Asia. The Japanese are renowned for their... Um, their timber framing and their joinery in particular. If, if you're interested, look up Japanese timber joinery. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so it says that there are differences. However, there are also some very striking similarities in the joinery details happening in other parts of the world. Um, here in America, so wood was abundant and um, timber framing flourished here. And so this is a colonial building. This is kind of a hodgepodge here. We like, we'll have a log cabin down the bottom with a timber frame built on top of it, but a kind of a striking building. So here's a, an image of an early American timber frame. I put these pictures here just to point out that often the frames would actually be concealed. Um, and it would, wasn't until you ended up up in the attic area where, where it would be shown the most, where we would see the rafters. So these are, would be uh, two rafters that were pinned at the top. Here's a column coming in down at the, the, the corner, or towards the bottom of the roof. So column beam or a plate, the rafters might be sitting on this plate, or the rafters might be sitting on down the plate down below, but I'd, I'd probably call that a plate. Um, yeah, and this is the gable end. And so we see here, columns, beams or girts, rafters. Okay, moving on. Um, so this is 
back to the history so industrialization dooms timber framing so the 19th century mid 19th century mid 19th century excuse me sawmills were were starting to produce small dimensional lumber the new american home could be built quickly and inexpensively by using dimensional lumber and and machine made nails and other fasteners so this is the middle of the 19th century so fewer work, workers were needed, and the new carpenter did not need to have the joinery skills that the timber rights possess. It became a whole different animal. So this is here, the B&O Railroad, mid-19th century. That's where it was starting to, um, to, to expand to. So essentially, before this time, timber frames were built on farms, built by with the wood that was on the farm. Um, once the railroad and the sawmills started producing small dimensionally lumber, if you lived on a railroad, you had access to it essentially. And this is the beginning of um, dimensional lumber, or um, yeah, framing, framing with dimensional lumber, I would call it. Um, so this is actually called the, the National. And I, I didn't really learn of this house until recently. I can't think of having seen many or any examples in my travels. Um, but I think it's a sharp, sharp looking little house. So this is one of our early um, framed houses, of American style. Okay, so this, this image here is showing us the, um, we'll pull him onto the screen a little more. Just make a little room there. Um, so this is showing us the evolution of the frame. So we had the timber frame originally, which we saw images of and we will see more of. And then here followed what follows the timber frame is the braced frame. So here, a lot of small um, dimensional lumber was infilling the frame, and then the frame went away and we had the balloon frame. So we'll be looking at this more in, up, in upcoming lessons on uh, dimensional framing, framing with uh, light light wood framing. Um, and this is the, the um, balloon frame here on the right, but we're not we're not concerned about the finer points of the balloon frame now, just to say that this is how we evolved away from the timber frame. Okay, so lo and behold, there is a resurgence of timber framing in the 1970s, and there are several reasons. Um, one, very important advances in the development of adhesives and insulation materials. So the older frames are great limitations. Um, I wouldn't say it, it didn't doom them, but there was definitely um, issues, problems. Um, but now new adhesives and especially a new system of insulating frames um, really help to make it, um, you know, meet code today, energy code. Um, use of engineered wood such as blue lamb timbers and laminated veneer lumbers. So we've already begun learning about those different products um, that, that are a lot less waste is, is um, you know, generated by the use of them. So again, a big plus for heavy frames, um, a resurgence of heavy frames. And then um, cutting frames with CNC machines. So again, more more advanced technology. Um, and yes, and we'll look at some videos at the end. So reasons why um, frames have um, kind of come back, have made a, made a comeback. Um, and another reason, so if you're particularly interested in frames, um, Ted Benson, he's the man. This is an early book of his, The Timber Frame Home, and it really explains how to, how to design with timber frames and um, really practical examples. He has other books that followed it, but they were just more like portfolios of his beautiful work. But if you really want to know the nuts and bolts of timber framing, um, this, this is the, uh, the go-to source. Okay, um, so getting back a little bit into the history, and then we'll move into uh, talking about the new insulation system. So originally, something called wattle and daub. This is the traditional method of infilling the panel. So you can see here, here are the um, timbers, and then the panel is the void. So here we have put up some pretty heavy sticks, and then with a basket weave, we've put in smaller sticks, and then this could be covered with a... Um, like a stucco-like substance, essentially. And that's what was called wattle and daub. So the frame that you saw on the exterior of the building, you would also see on the interior of the building. And that is what is called a thermal bridge. When, when one component from a, um, a single component stretches from outside where it is cold to inside where it is warm, that's called creating a thermal bridge. And that's not a good thing. We want to have an envelope, 
a seamless envelope and everything that's on the outside stays on the outside and everything that's on the inside stays on the inside. Um, and that obviously not, not accomplished here. So moving on to the, um, the, the invention of SIPs panels, SIPs, so that structurally insulated panels provide a great R value. Um, and what it is is two pieces of oriented strand board. So these are the shavings from um, that create kind of really cheap plywood. It's it's not nothing nothing impressive about this material except how, how cheap and efficient it is. Um, so there are two pieces of that that are sandwiching a, a piece of um, foam core, essentially. So it's it's a great great product. And um, just seeing if there's more detail on that. So they typically come in, they could be four inch, six inch, eight inches thick, and they could come four feet wide by, um, typically bigger, they don't, they make them a lot bigger than plywood, typically 12, 14, 16 foot pieces. So they cover, they cover a lot of ground and they're heavy and you'll see some installation um, views of them. Okay. So um, SIPs create a whole new world for timber framing. So here, okay, that's what I was saying. Panels range in size from uh, 4 by 8 to 4 by 24. Yeah, this is what I was looking like. Um, they're shimmed to walls, so the drywall fits neatly behind them. Uh, you don't, I don't see a clear image of that here. <coughs> we will see some coming up. So you want to um, create a little void between the panel and the timber so that the drywall can come behind it. And we'll, and we'll see a, 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 a detail of that shortly. Um, panels are easily cut to provide openings for doors and windows. Um, having timber framed, and I'll talk about it and show some images, um, easily is, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's relatively speaking. It's, it's definitely doable, but it's, it's not simple. And these are the splines that join them together. So this is one panel here, and then this would be a void and then it meets up with another panel here on the left, and then this spline is put in, and then it's screwed from top to bottom um, every foot or so. So it makes a very rigid system that way. This is cut out, obviously, for a pipe to run through it, so this would have to be <coughs> um, pre-coordinated, obviously, with shop drawings. And here we see a detail. So here we see the foundation, the sill. We have the floor coming in, and then they bring the wall panels down in front of um, in front of the floor joist system which is which is smart so this is very well insulated all the way down to the foundation wall and then um, running wires down below it so the wires are fed through to the basement um, up to the outlets and interior so doing the doing doing the um, dealing with pipes and um, electrical and um, mechanical systems, if uh, you know air, if if they are on the exterior wall, that's that's a pain. That is not not easy. Okay, moving on. So some details of the SIPs panels. So here's our our timber column, and then we lay in this one, and it's nailed to the column. And we lay in this one, and then these two by dimensional lumber is let into it. Um, so a, a channel would be carved out with a hot knife, carving out the foam, and then that two by is, is placed within it or let into it, and that creates the solid nailing for the siding that would follow. Mm -hmm. Here we see it, the rafter detail. So here's the timber frame. That would be the column, the rafter, and the beam that's coming at us. So here we first put in the wall panel, angle cut to the slope of the roof, and then the um, roof panel comes down, nailed in at the base, and another two by is let in at the bottom to um, support the fascia and gutter. Okay, moving on to looking at some tools. So here we are with the um, SIPS panel, and this is a hot knife. So he will, the carpenter will run this along the edge, and this is where the two by six or sub or so two by material will be let into to create that solid edge. So he's using a hot knife. <coughs> Horrible smell of burning styrofoam. Um, so here is a roof panel being dropped on. So the crane has it, and these are tow boards for the carpenters. So you can see very large, covers a lot of ground quickly some traditional timber framing tools, so chisels, aids, 
aids, ads, ads. I don't know if you've some ads for, for taking um, bark, I believe, off. Very heavy duty. Um, large chisels, um, draw knives. This is definitely for taking bark off. And some drills and mortise pressing, mortise presses. Um, yes, these are the traditional ones. And some of these are still used today. And then some power tools. So this is what a modern timber right would have. So again, chisels, large hammers, planes are very important for shaving wood very thinly. This would be for cutting the mortise, so this would just be dropped right into the beam, kind of plunged, chainsaw, variety of large circular saws. Um, this is a, a plane, an electric plane, a very, very large plane to just shave the uh, surface, the um, entire si side of a large timber. These are the two main, the large circular sort for cutting, and this is for the mortising, so this would be plunged. So these hydraulics are for plunging that straight down into a timber that this would be mounted on. Large saw. And it's definitely still used for hand tools, so these are beautiful Japanese saws. These cut on the pull stroke, unlike Western saws that cut on the push stroke. There's a saying in timber framing that Everything is measured with a micrometer and marked with a crayon and then cut with a chainsaw. So a lot of precision goes into it. Um, and we try to keep it as precise as possible as we go. But it's not really fin uh, furniture making like this. And ratchet straps are very important once the frames are, are assembled to pull them together. It takes a lot of um, strength, a lot of uh, fighting kind of with the frame to get it to go to where you want to. So here's a beam across the top, column, brace. So it would have been joined and then the ratchet strap to pull it together. So no crocs on the job site. That's definitely not OSHA approved. Big hammers for putting them into place. Right here. Cranes. Very helpful. So here is a bent one continuous piece, two rafters, two columns, brace, I call that one bent, here's a second bent, and then the crane is bringing up the ridge beams to connect. Here's a production facility inside the shop, everything is cut and put together and then disassembled and taken to the job site. Bigger facility. fitting something up in the shop to be taken apart. And take a look at some joints. So here we have a column. There's a beam coming into it. So there is the tenon that will be let into the mortise. And here come the pegs to secure it. Um, here, top, again, these would be plates that rafters would rest on. This would be the primary rafter. It would be sitting here and then join. These would be for lateral bracing. Let in here and then let in uh, with this plate again. So here we are laying out and carving a uh, rafter tail that appears. It's on an angle. So here's a, a joint. Appears to be perhaps a scarf joint where these two will lock in with each other. Here's a scarf joint where they lock in and overlap. They're, they are maximizing the surface um, surface area that the two are touching. Uh, the, the, two, the point of contact trying to maximize that the, the square inches there for transmitting loads efficiently from one to the next. And there you can see a beautiful joint. There's pegged in the middle there, locking them in. Another version of a scarf joint, this one cut straight across, so you could imagine these could get very intricate. Typically one, just let the geometry of the joint just um, efficiently allow the forces to, to travel through from beam to beam to column. The pegs are just kind of holding them together, they really shouldn't be stressed too much in terms of doing actual work. And, in terms of carrying stresses, we try to let gravity in the frame just kind of move the loads down. And there's a very pretty frame, column, beams coming in. 
And we have this tenon that would be placed inside. I imagine it's cut up and into here, probably through all the way here. So these pegs would be running through the beam, through the tenon, back to the back side of the beam. Here's hammer beams right here, that detail. Here's a beautiful church with a double hammer beam. So this is all for lateral resistance. So the wind so the wind yeah, wind essentially isn't isn't stressing the frame in this direction. The hammer beam would help push back, providing lateral resistance. You can see it right here. You can see the, the detail telling us the, the size of the timbers, telling us the location of the pegs, telling us how far each member is let into the others. You don't want you want you want it to be properly seated and housed in there, but you don't want to take out any any more wood than necessary from this column piece. And just a couple of big overviews. So again, this is a bent, I would call this. Typically timber, timber frames are put up bent by bent by bent, kind of like uh, stacked cards that are being raised. So here is the ridge. We have up at the top rafters coming down the sides. These are purlin pockets. So purlins connect from one to the next. Let me just back up a slide, see if we can see purlins right here. That would be a purlin. There's a purlin. Purlins right there. So those are the purlin pockets, except those collar ties are the members that tie two rafters together, even with dimensional framing. We'll have collar ties in the, in the attic to help prevent these two rafters from pulling away from each other. And we have columns or posts. Here girts or beams, I would call it a girt or a beam, accepted by the, which will hold up the joists. So these are joist pockets. Struts and braces are again provide the lateral support. Okay, moving on. Here's a three dimensional view of it. So, again, rafters, purlins running from rafter to rafter, an eaves plate that's the beam running at the top of the columns at the bottom of the rafters sit on, uh, mid span plates connecting vents. So, again, this, this two rafters one, two, three, four columns. Um, that that would make up one vent. Everything that's in this two-dimensional plane is in that vent. And then there's so this is the first vent, and then here's the second vent beyond, third vent beyond, fourth vent, and then there are plates connecting plates or girts connecting the vents. So here we have a mid mid-span plate, mid-span on the rafter that would be, and then we have another girt down below connecting column to column braces for lateral support, and here we have our structurally insulated panels on the outside. And one final, so here we have principal rafters that sit on columns, and then we have common rafters that sit on the plates. There's the end girt, the end of the house, or the gable end girt, I would call it. If this is a gable roof, I would call this the gable end. Um, then we have joists inside, running from side to side, running in line or in the same direction as the girts. Um, running down, we have our principal rafter, again a collar beam, keeping these two rafters from pushing out. They're, it's resisting the outward thrust of the two rafters. Purlins connecting from rafter to rafter. End girt, the end of the house, same as this end girt. Plates on top of columns that that rafters sit down on, posts or columns, uh, say front girt, the front girt, the mid-span on the column girt, and then sills at the very bottom, and then studs for infill. Okay, just going to sh briefly show you the videos, um, otherwise I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, now for the videos, um, I'm not going to watch these entire videos with you, I encourage you to take a look at them. Thoroughly. I'm just going to show a couple highlights. So again, on the front page of this presentation were the names, Timber Frame Cottage Raising in Pennsylvania, so you can just go to YouTube and search for that. And um, let's take a quick look at this one. So this is a um, quick motion raising of the frame. So here we see the first bent going up. You can see it's supported by the crane. Here's bent number two that would follow being raised up. And what we're going to see is it goes quite quickly. I'm just going to We'll probably watch this whole one almost. Um, so 
you're going to see some temporary bracing holding these things in place as well as the um, the girts that are going to connect them and they'll have temporary bracing probably beneath them so let's just run through it and see what we see all right there's the temporary bracing coming in the temp the next skirts and then there's the next bent and raised joined with that ridge beam going in at the top and more more plates or bents more bents going in the square fashion so here should come some beams tops possibly a large ridge beam up at the top being placed in Or, so yeah, so that would be the ridge beam rafters coming down. This is the plate, the top plate, and continuing on. Okay, I'm gonna pause that one. Move on to the next. All right, so this one, just a little bit. This one is just gonna kind of give us. This one's called timber framing Clydesdale frames. Let's just run it. Um, just going to give us a close-up of um, some of the operations. So they're squaring up the joints very important. So he, that, that was um, routing out a mortise, drilling, used for chisels, of course. So cleaning out a pocket. There's a mortise plunger cutting in. And then on the job site here, I think we're going to see a couple images just of, uh, let's see. Here we go. So there's the there's the timber frame getting raised, so very creaky. I'm just gonna just go back to that a little more pause that. So very important. So here these extra braces. So this is the one girt, columns, rafters, everything in line, and then they'll lay additional two by material over it and put heavy duty um, clamps on it to keep this thing from um, Da damaging itself essentially as it's lifting so this is a very vulnerable time for the frame to be lifted like this so um, it has extra extra clamping and bracing to give it the support that it needs and this is the crane or somebody probably the crane letting down a, a large beam and then being housed into a pocket so again lining all these pieces up and doing it very carefully and very safely is an important part of the process so letting letting a beam into a pocket, and there's a tenon, and then when it when it's fully seated in there, then it, you know, the holes will line for it to be um, pegged next. Okay, and then finally one more. This is just a quick quick look at um, the five-axis wood CNC machining. So this is not a human being in sight here. This is all computer driven, um, making quick quick time of this frame so very very cool tool um, you know it doesn't have that handcrafted feel to it um, but but a, another important part of the industry as well you know okay so I hope you enjoy please take a look at the videos and um, we will uh, follow up with a second lecture on this thank you